Blessed Apollo, be gracious to me and inspire my heart for the truly fair speech to sing for the dead living around the earth, playing the melodious lyre as if a muse whispers to me. For the first time, the name of Orpheus was mentioned in the 7th century BC in a fragment by the southern Italic poet Ibicus. The name of Orpheus was accompanied by the attribute the famous, which means to show that this was the way a century-old tradition in speaking was written down. The first in ancient times to speak most comprehensively about Orpheus was Theodorus. Orpheus was the son of the native Thracian Oegrus, and far beyond superior in education, singing and poetry to the many who are mentioned in history. He reached such fame that it was believed that animals and trees used to fall under his spell. After he devoted entirely to science and learned the gods' tales, he left for Egypt, and after he learned there is still much more, he became the greatest among the Hellenes in the area of God's deeds, mysteries, poems and songs. He participated in the Argonauts' expedition. For love of his wife, he dared in an incredible way to go down into the Kingdom of Shadows. By his sweet singing, he charmed Persephone and made her allow him to take his dead wife out of Hades. Is all this true? Who in fact was Orpheus? Where did he live and when? From whom did he learn? And why was he killed? The investigation related to Orpheus began in the presence of dozens of pieces of historical evidence, contemporary theories, museum expositions and archaeological excavations. There are dozens of images that prove the Thracian origin of Orpheus. Today, this proof is scattered all over the world because the image and the ideas of the great dedicated singer have reached far beyond the borders of Thrace for centuries ever since and excite people thousands of kilometers away. Vicenza, Italy. The Apulian Volute Crater, painted by the artist Likorg in the 14th century BC, is kept in a safety vault of the local bank. In the centre of the scene, which includes a number of characters, is Orpheus with a Phrygian hat, and to the left and to the right of him are men in Thracian clothing. A little to the south, a columnar crater created in the 5th century BC is exhibited in the archaeological museum of the town of Siena. Orpheus, sitting on a rock, is depicted in the centre, playing the lyre and singing. On both sides, two men in Thracian clothing can clearly be seen, each of them holding two spears. In spite of some claims of Greek scientists to the contrary, in neighbouring Greece we find still more pictorial evidence of the Thracian origin of Orpheus. Corinth. On the crater, 
exhibited in the local museum, we see Orpheus playing the lyre sitting on a rock, surrounded by two men in Thracian wear. The crater originates from the 5th century BC and was found here. Indisputable proof that the local population knew about the Thracian origin of Orpheus. The Archaeological Museum of Athens. Here are preserved two fragments from two craters, depicting Orpheus sitting on a rock, playing the lyre before men in Thracian clothing. In 1975, two marble fragments were found during excavation works in the centre of the city of Starozagora, previously called Augusta Triana. They are part of an impressively large sculptural group depicting Orpheus among animals. A century earlier, in the city of Augusta Triana, one more memorial of Orpheus an inscription engraved in a pedestal of a statue was found, and it reads, Good luck. Terra is devoted to the healer a finely made statue of Apollo's friend, Orpheus, who, by his voice and by the sounds coming from his hands, enchanted animals, trees, reptiles and birds. Up to now, this inscription is the only written memorial found in Bulgaria which is devoted to Orpheus. The most popular image of Orpheus from this period is the relief discovered in 1961 under a sundial in Durostrum, today's town of Silistra. Orpheus, sitting on a rock and playing the lyre among animals, is depicted between two columns with Corinthian capitals. So far, the relief from the rostrum is our only, most complete and comparatively most preserved iconographic image of Orpheus. Another similar memorial was discovered 200 kilometers southwest of the rostrum, in the clay furnace of the village of Butovo, in the region of Velikotonovo, a ceramic mold with the image of Orpheus among animals was found. Its make reveals good workmanship. Obviously, using it, dozens of pledging tiles were produced for the market. This is a fact that proves the great popularity of Orpheus. We have learned that Orpheus was a Thracian. Now let us look for an answer to the question, when did he live? For this purpose, we need to recall the most renowned expedition of ancient times, that of the Argonauts. It is known that Orpheus was an Argonaut to Colchis. He was on board the ship Argo, not so much as a singer, but as a magus, who performed a ritual at the culminating moment of the expedition, when Jason was to take the golden fleece hung on a great oak tree in a beautiful garden, guarded by a ferocious dragon. Orpheus saved the Argonauts for the second time when, with his music, he drowned the song of the sirens who were enticing the heroes of Colchis to the depths of the sea. Besides Orpheus, also taking part in the expedition were Peleus, the father of the glorious Achilles, Laertes, the father of the cunning Odysseus, Telamon, the father of the great Ajax, and many more fathers of heroes from the Trojan War. And here is the answer to the question. We can affirm that Orpheus lived one generation before the Trojan War, that is, in the 14th century BC. This particular period of time is also supported by an inscription from the town of Paros, where one finds quoted the legendary events which led to the creation of the Eleusinian Mysteries. The dating is also pointed out in the Pseudo-Lexicon, which was written in the 10th century AD. Egypt, the Museum of the City of Cairo. 
as the battle for Troy marks the beginning of the chronology for many events on the European continent, so the battle for Kadesh is the marking point for our chronology on Egyptian territory. Sixty years before the war between Egyptians and Syrians, that is, at the time of Orpheus, the king heretic Echnaton, whose sculpture you see, introduced the cult to the sun disk. It is assumed that this was the first monotheistic cult in human history. The images of Echnaton present him under the beams of the sun disk, which are depicted like hands which embrace only the king and the queen and terminate with the symbol of lie. The merging of the king with the sun happened after his death. At least, that's what Egyptian sources say. In the religion of King Echnaton, it seems that this happened during one's lifetime and the king was filled with light and with the invigorating force of the sun while he was still on earth. This was also in the foundation of his doctrine, whereby, not by chance, Echnaton was the first Egyptian ruler who left his own teaching. But was it possible for monotheism and its doctrine about the sun god to reach Europe from Egypt? In the middle of the first millennium BC, in spite of the loss of its dominating power, Egypt remained a source of knowledge about the divine and a center for civilization. The ancient authors visited Egypt, admired the millennia-old traditions and learned from it as much as they could. Heliopolis and Memphis were the equivalent of Harvard and Oxford in the modern world. Alongside many other ancient authors, Diodorus had also been to Egypt. It is he who gave us a list of the well-known persons who visited Egypt from most ancient times, beginning with the name of Orpheus. Respected as one of the wise men of the world, the story goes that he studied in Egypt and learned the art of the magic rhythmic verse. In this story, we also see the conviction of the ancient people that the belief of the sun god, which flourished in Egypt towards the middle of the second millennium BC, came to our lands from there. The acquisition of knowledge in ancient Egypt was an extraordinarily difficult process. Today, there are still legends about how, after facing serious challenges, only a few succeeded in reaching the final. But what could the reason be for a man to leave his relatives and the comfortable life he had and to set out on a long journey with an uncertain end, marked with unprecedented trials? The answer may be hidden behind a great but unfulfilled love. Orpheus for Eurydice was so strong that he without fear entered the netherworld to ask for her return from her master, the cold-hearted Hades. On his way to the world beyond, he managed to enchant with his music the boatsman Charon, who used to carry across the river Styx no living men but the souls of the dead. After that, also with his lyre, he won over to his side the three-headed fearful dog Cerberus, the guard of the entrance to Tartara. Finally, he moved the very god of the netherworld, Hades. Hades gave back Eurydice, but under the condition that she followed him until they reached the upper world and that Orpheus should not look back. However, Orpheus did not withstand the temptation and only a moment before he let her out of the place inhabited by the dead, he looked back to see whether she was following him, and so he lost her forever. The second parting of the two in love was the reason for Orpheus to leave, far from his memories, far from Thrace. Mm -hmm. 
The informed say that it was just after Orpheus went out of the netherworld that he departed for the temples of ancient Egypt to learn the lessons of immortality. The knowledge which he received, he later taught to his students. According to tradition of Indo-Iran, the king died and was born periodically, as in nature. In order for this to happen, he had to go up high in the mountains. There, the ruling first priest sacrificed a large animal or a man, which symbolized his own death. Then he entered into a symbolic marriage with the mother goddess, gave her fertility, and was then reborn. The Thracians had cruel and bloody rituals before Orpheus came. The great singer made an attempt to change them, and indeed he succeeded in many places. Centuries thereafter, the old beliefs and the new ideas existed in parallel. From Plato's texts in Laws, we can get an idea of what the Orphic bloodless sacrifice meant. Their sacrifice for the gods were not animals, but loaves of bread and fruits dipped in honey, and also other similar clean sacrifices. They abstained from eating meat, because it was not pious, and did not stain God's altar with blood. The late hymns of Orpheus make the picture complete with the record about burning of seeds and sensing with aromatic herbs. Obviously Orpheus was much more than a talented singer from ancient times. He was a reformer, priest and teacher. Pausanias calls him the Great Magus and Demosthenes defines him as the prophet of the most sacred mysteries. As early as in the 6th century BC, Pindar wrote, and from Apollo, playing the lyre, descended the father of songs, the most glorious Orpheus. Pseudo-Euripides affirms, Orpheus lit the torch of the secret mysteries. Whilst the Roman geographer Pomponius Mela adds, the rallying place for the Mianads was first organized by Orpheus. According to the story by Conon, the force which Orpheus possessed over living and over inanimate nature was equal to a rule over the cosmos. It becomes clear that the ancient Hellenes whose written evidence we use understood under music not only the skill of playing an instrument and singing sweetly, but also poetry, knowledge and wisdom. More evidence that Orpheus was not only a musician and a singer, but also one who performed sacraments, a teacher and a priest, is presented by his numerous images on Greek vases. Initially, Orpheus was depicted on them in typical Thracian ware. Gradually, his image was Hellenized. In these scenes, Orpheus is sitting on a high mountain peak and praises and shows devotion to the belief in the sun god. His music enchants and transmits the sound of cosmic energy. The singer performing the sacraments is surrounded by Thracians. Some of them are naked, a sign indicating that they are participating in a religious sacrament. Others are covered with zeros, thus depicting symbolically that they are preparing themselves for the sacrament. In order to present these images, we undertook a long journey.
Germany. In the museum of the city of Berlin, an amphora from Gela is preserved. The scene depicts the devotion in its culmination. Orpheus is among armed Thracians, fascinated by his music. He is in the role of a teacher who teaches the sacrament. Two of the Thracians accompanying Orpheus are depicted having turned their backs on the singer and it appears as if they have just passed through the sacrament. The other two are depicted facing the playing Orpheus. One has bent before him just at the moment of the sacrament and the other is still covered with his era, waiting for his turn to come. In looking for the image of Orpheus, we reached the town of Bari, Italy, where the so-called Amphora of Bari is kept. The sitting Orpheus occupies the center of the area of depiction and plays a big lyre. As a typical Thracian, the standing warrior leads a white horse. The man opposite Orpheus is spreading incense. He is naked except the cloak over his shoulders and a wreath on his long curly hair, which leads to the conclusion that he is presented as devoted to the sacrament. We turn north to Switzerland, to Basel, where we look at the crater with a scene similar to that in Bari. Orpheus Kitterid, dressed in oriental wear, is sitting on a chair flanked by two men. The one behind the hero is in Thracian clothes. The young man before Orpheus is naked and is lighting incense. The teacher-student relations were documented for the first time in ancient Egypt as early as in the beginning of the third millennium BC. The idea about studentship and devotion is constantly interlocked with the notion related to most of the ancient wise men and philosophers, including Orpheus. Having got the necessary knowledge in Egypt, he acquired wisdom and enlightenment. The devoted went back to his native places to share what he learned with the chosen ones from his community. The very idea of individual devotion in the sacraments presumes the liberation of the soul from the cyclic sequence of rebirth and defines Orphism as a religion of individual belief and personal choice. The time has come to ask one of the most important questions. Why was the great singer killed? What were the reasons for the death of the beloved favorite? Religious, political, or... During the first century BC, Ovid, in his Metamorphoses, describes the last moments of Orpheus in the following way. One of them, waving her hair in the light air, shouted, It's him who despises us, and threw her tears straight to the sonorous image of the son of Apollo, the singer. However, the leafed scepter made no wound but a scar. The second used no weapon but a stone, but still in flight it was overpowered by the sounding song and lyre. And, as if asking for an excuse, 
but the vicious offensiveness it lay in front of his feet. The song would have tamed all strikes, but horrible shout, together with the twisted pipes of the Berekentian flutes, echoes from kettle drums, flapping and bacchanalian cries deadened the sound of the strings. And then finally, the rocks became scarlet with the blood of the singer and ceased his voice. Basel, Switzerland. The following picture is shown on a stamnos from the 5th century BC. Orpheus has fallen down with the lyre in his right hand, stretched under his head. He's naked, covered by a crimson cloak. Crimson is also the color of the flowing blood. A spit is stuck in the hip of the hero. Four Thracian women are attacking the singer. They are armed with stones, spits and pestles, and the one who is bent over his head is about to cut his head off at any moment with a short sword. An amphora with the following painted scene is kept in the same museum. A Thracian woman with a long spear is piercing Orpheus. The wound in his chest is bleeding. In his right hand, he is holding his lyre high, as if he wants to defend himself with it. Munich, Germany. On an amphora, one can see a woman armed with a sword. She is attacking Orpheus, who is facing her. In his right hand, he is waving a lyre. The woman is clearly presented as a Thracian, because she has a tattoo on her hands. The gods, however, were angry with the Bacantias and sent them drought and pestilence. In order to regain the benevolence of the gods, they began to look for the parts of Orpheus, but found only his head, which continued to sing, floating in a river. The Bacantias took it, buried it, and made a big mound over it. On a hydria created in the 5th century BC, the prophesying head of Orpheus in a rocky niche is shown in a central place. A man with a ribbon resembling a Bacantian person dances over it. He is surrounded by women who hold musical instruments, probably muses. Tarrant, Italy. The theme of the sanctuary of Orpheus is further developed on another clay pot. An Alleluian crater presents figures painted in red by a painter from Athens at the beginning of the 5th century. Depicted here is the scene of the murder of Orpheus by Thracian women armed with spits and sticks. The interesting thing in this case is that Orpheus is depicted on a stone building which very much resembles the Heroons, the places where dead heroes were honoured and turned into demigods. The last two compositions portray that after his death, Orpheus was turned into a god and that his grave became a sacred place. In time, it became a sanctuary where Orpheus was honoured as a god. The sanctuary near the village of Tatu. It was studied 30 years ago by Professor Ivan Venedikov. His final conclusion was that the famous Thracian king was buried in the tomb on a truncated pyramid. And in the next centuries, around it, a sanctuary Heroon was formed. The distinguished scientists did not exclude the possibility that this was a symbolic or even the real grave of Orpheus. In fact, you can see that. It is a rock 
which is shaped from all sides. The tomb is on it, the confusing tomb. The interesting thing is that between its upper part and the bottom there is a connection, that is, some fluid cascaded from the top to the bottom. Also, other things were made in the surrounding parts, about some of which we cannot judge. Here is a niche for laying down presents in various steps, which lead to the upper part. In perspective, one can see the so-called holy well, something extraordinary. Pit, almost three meters deep, is dug into the rock, about which we suggest that presents were stored there. Our excavations show that this was a sanctuary, which was visited not only by Thracians from the surrounding areas, but also by people from Asia Minor, from the Aegean Islands, and even from Crete. This means, even in the second millennium BC, the sanctuary at Tatul was dedicated to some hero, who was famous in the whole civilized world at that time, and such a hero is Orpheus. The primary source of matter, Kronos, or time, produced in the ether a world egg. It split into two parts, and from its shells, the earth and heaven were formed. From its core appeared the first god, the bisexual Phanes, emitting light. Phanes was swallowed by the son of Zeus, Kronos, who, in this way, acquires full power over the world. Zeus had a wonderful inheritor, Dionysus Agrius, who was tempted by the Titans with a mirror. And while he was looking at himself in the mirror, they tore him to pieces and ate him. This was the original sin, and because of it, Zeus struck them down with a lightning bolt. From the ashes of the Titans, people were born, and they inherited two natures, the heavenly part of the first Dionysus and the terrestrial part from the sinful Titans. As a result of all this, the soul of man is heavenly and immortal, but it is locked up in the darkness of the body. After the death of the body, it is born anew in another living creature. And to make an end to this pilgrimage of the soul from body to body, it is necessary to live on the earth in harmony, enlightenment and asceticism, not to kill animals and not to eat their meat. The followers of Orpheus, the Orphics, following the example of their teacher and patron, were also divided into parts after their death and were buried in different places. The same was done with the body of the Thracian king, Suthis III, who ruled the Udrisi kingdom from the end of the 4th and the first years of the 3rd century BC. Suthis III founded his capital, Suthopolis, not far from the present-day town of Kazanlak now on the bottom of the Kuprinka Reservoir. The king was buried in an impressive stone temple in the Mount Guliama Kusmatka, near the town of Shipka. Again in 2004, and again near the town of Shipka, the expedition of Dr. Kitov came upon one more Orphic ritual. It was performed in the second half of the 5th century BC, that is a century earlier than the first one. The discovery is in the mound called Svetitsa. In the same grave, the mask was put in the place where the skull should be. In other words, it substituted it as a ticket for the outer world, because for the Orphix, Tombs were regarded as the doors to the outer world. On the other hand, the gold mask meant one more thing. The Egyptian conjurations tell us that the sun should light up the body of the dead so that he could see again and regain the abilities of the living people. By placing the gold mask on his face, in fact, the priest pours the sunlight onto it and opens his eyes. The body of the dead becomes a godly body and he reaches immortality, merging with the sun. Gold as a divine material is also used in the production of Orphic small plates, 
which are closely related to the practices of the Egyptian burial rituals and are found within a broad Mediterranean circle from southern Italy to Crete and northern Greece. Formerly, the plates were small gold leaves made of thin foil and inscribed with small print and placed in the graves of the believing Orphics. Most of them are found folded so that they could be worn as amulets. The folding itself had a ritual character and was to hide the text from the eyes of the undevoted. The plates were rolled up so as to be put in the mouth. Most probably, in this way, the exact words were to be put in the mouth of the dead. Besides the text on the gold plates, the vase writing gives us additional illustration of the Orphic notion about the outer world. A great number of the Hellenic images speak not so much about Orpheus, the singer, since they bring us into the netherworld kingdom, the final aim of human existence according to the common Orphic concept of the world. In this context, the Thracian appeared as saver of the souls. In other words, he led the devoted in his belief in rituals to the kingdom of Hades. On some exhibits, in the hands of the participants in the scenes, scrolls are depicted, and on the breasts of others, plates are hung. In southern Italy, there is a link between the scenes on the vases and the texts on the gold plates. Germany, Munich. On the crater exhibited in the local museum, next to Orpheus, a naked mist is depicted, who holds a wreath over his head. Next to him are a woman and a child, most probably devoted Orphix. This suggestion could be supported by the fact that on his breast the child wears a chain with an amulet, as Orphic plates were probably worn. To the right of the main scene, a ruler and a white-haired old man with shepherd's crook, characteristic of the devotion scenes, are depicted. Helios is depicted on the upper band of the crater and the lower band presents Hermes looking at Heracles, who leads the three-headed dog Cerberus. Switzerland, the museum in Basel. There are two Ionian columns depicted in the middle of the exhibited amphora. Inside the building presented here, there is a man sitting. In his left hand, the man holds a scroll, probably a papyrus. Orpheus enters from the left and goes to the sitting man. Here we find a reference to Orphism. The picture on this vase clearly shows us the link between Orpheus and the dead man holding the scroll. The secret Orphic texts and practices are yet another analogy with Egyptian rituals and beliefs. In the Book of the Dead, it is explicitly said that it is a strictly kept secret, which must not be shared with anybody, even with the closest relatives, brothers, sisters, mother and father. Necessary to be studied in this life and is not only a ritual element and part of the burial practice. In ancient Egypt, the dead arraigned before the court in Osiris, where his soul was judged according to the principles of the goddess Maat. Maat represented cosmic harmony and the natural order of existence. Passing through this court, the dead moved to the outer world. The Egyptians, however, did not conceive the journey of the soul as the changing of one body with another and as movement in a millennium-long cycle, but rather as an ability of the soul to make its own body and shape. This is where we see the substantial differences between the teaching of ancient Egypt and Orphism. With Egyptians, the orderly theory for the migration of the souls did not exist. Popular, no, the popular and at the same time systematic teaching about the migration of the soul was created 
thanks to Orphism, and to Pythagoras, Empedocles, and Plato. Of course, what was written by them did not contain anything new, and the possible source is difficult to be restored. In any case, the idea did not come from Egypt, but from India. For millennia, the peoples populating the banks of the Indus and the Ganges have believed that every soul is divine and can achieve its essential aim, merging with the divine through purification and discipline. Still today, millions of Hindus meet and forward the sun. They do it the same way their forefathers have done it for more than 4,000 years. The belief of these children is similar to the belief of their ancestors, that man possesses an eternal soul which is reborn millions of times in different forms according to the moral code called karma. Karma itself is not a reward nor a punishment. It is a law, just as impartial and irreversible as the law of gravity. It is possible to break free from the chain of reincarnations through knowledge, action, and devotion to God. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? What was earlier said about Orphism corresponds exceptionally strongly with what is said here about the belief in India. The conclusions also show that Orphism is a belief which was formed in the middle of the second millennium BC and is based on ancient Egyptian and Mediterranean beliefs. It continued until the fourth century AD, when the Christian period began. Few know that apart from the millennia-old memory of the music which he created, Orpheus has reached us woven into maybe the most popular character of all times, the character of Jesus. Here, in two of the catacombs, we found the image of the Thracian teacher, precisely because of the miracles which Orpheus' words, songs and music performed, Christian masters borrowed the ancient images of Orpheus for the iconography of Jesus. From time immemorial, the singer is the main character of a man who enchanted nature and therefore possessed a supernatural force. In the pure Christian aspect, Orpheus is the characteristic equivalent of the power of divine speech and of divine truth, which leads to salvation and to eternal life. We can say that Orpheus stood before the new era of Christianity in order to give it a particle of the energy of the divine knowledge about death and the new birth. We shall stop the search for Orpheus here. For us, he's already not only the great singer of ancient times. Orpheus is also the teacher, the teacher of the human soul, no matter whether it inhabited the body of a Thracian or of an Achaean. Orpheus chose a few people to whom to pass on his knowledge by means of words, but through his songs he praised all. Even more, his music vibrated in the souls of animals, in the trees and in the rocks. Because, as a true great devoted one, Orpheus came to this world to take care not only of us, people, but also of all creatures, great and small, thus preparing our souls for their long journey. The journey to immortality. Mm -hmm.